Sir, your parents wanted you to be a doctor, you wanted to be a pilot. Where did that love of aviation come from? Well, when we got old enough to know what I was talking about, why, uh, my father told me I was going to become a doctor. Uh, having learned earlier not to disagree with him and openly, uh, I believed him. I believed him until I got my first airplane ride at the age of about 12. And uh, that was a very interesting deal. The Curtis Candy Company was trying to promote a new candy bar called the Baby Ruth. They had hired a barnstormer to fly an airplane around, loaded down with candy bars to which they had attached paper parachutes. And this is Miami, Florida. My father was the Southern Florida distributor for Babe Curtis Candy. And obviously the baby roost to go in that airplane came to his office or his warehouse and paper parachutes. And I was asked if I'd come in on a Saturday morning and uh, help put the parachutes around the candy bars. And I volunteered to do that real nicely. When the job was all done, probably just about one o'clock in the day, uh, the pilot, Doug Davis, he asked, he said, Mr. Tibbetts, I'm going to need a, a volunteer to go with me to throw these bars out the front cockpit. I'll throw with one hand out the back and so forth. I, of course, immediately volunteered. My father said, not you. And Doug looked at him. He said, Mr. Tibbetts, he said, I'm married. I got a very fine wife. I got two lovely daughters. I'm not going to go out and kill myself. And damn well, I'm not going to hurt him. My father had a very understanding partner by the name of Bob Smith. Bob spoke up. He said, Paul, let him go for Christ's sake. That got me my first airplane ride. We went to Hialeah Racetrack and uh, flying around. I don't know. Today, as I look back on it, we were probably about 100 feet. Now, we did not fly over the, over the grandstands, no. Doug knew enough that he didn't do that, and he stayed out uh, basically over the track, and we went laced back and forth the distance of the grandstand, throwing these bars out and watching people come running to pick them up. I don't know what kind of a consternation it called with the horse races, but anyway, uh, we flew merrily back to the place, picked up uh, nothing but a dirt patch, picked up another box of stuff, started out and went over to Miami Beach and flew up and down the beach at probably a hundred feet at the most and uh, throwing those bars out. So that really convinced me. I, the thrill of the takeoff, I remember that just as clearly as could be because we start down this rough piece of dirt and things bouncing like a car run over a rough road. The next thing is, it looks to me like we're standing still. I look out, there's no trees or telephone poles to go by to tell you how fast we're going. And I thought, Jesus, that's really a something. But I did learn a lot better than that in watching this airplane going back and forth in front of the grandstand and, and on the beach. But then I knew that I was going to have to be a pilot. I didn't tell my dad because I didn't have nerve enough at age 12 to say anything. But I guess the best way to do it is to say that after that ride and with what I had in the back of my mind, I have to go with it now till I'm in college. And uh, I was, if I remember right, it, I was 18 years old at the time, not in college, excuse me, that I was in military school and graduated at the age of 18, went to Miami, Florida, where my parents lived, and enrolled to go to the University of Florida to take up pre-med. Now that was the way that we worked that thing. I also, my dad was good to me, he gave me money to buy gasoline for an automobile, those types of things, and pay my food bills and whatnot at the fraternity house. And uh, I just lived that first year in, you know, fine deal. On, when summer came, vacation time came, I was back in Miami again. And I went out and found an airport, North Miami, at that time called Sunny South and uh, they had some airplanes there. And I went in to inquire about did they teach people how to fly. They certainly did. And I got an instructor type, a man that I hung on to for a long time. And uh, 
he uh, took me up. Uh, I soloed the first year. In other words, I don't know how many hours I had. I didn't keep track of it. To me, I was doing something I wasn't supposed to do, and I didn't want any trails left behind me. And on the basis of that, uh, I got through that summer by uh, making a solo flight uh, with a man by the name of Rusty Hurd. Rusty was a great person. He was a, a reserve mechanic in the Marine Corps uh, at Opelika. And uh, he later left Opelika. He went to Eastern Airlines and became a very senior captain and retired. And then he got killed flying an antique airplane right in front of my old man's house, almost in front of my old man's house, uh, many years later. I don't remember the year, but uh, I always remember Rusty because he got me started. Now, with Rusty getting me started, I went to the University of Cincinnati because Florida had no medical school at that time. And uh, so I had to go to Cincinnati. That was because of a family connection. My dad knew a uh, man, been a friend of his in Quincy, Illinois for years. And uh, this man was related to, he was an uncle to a doctor, a very famous doctor, a urologist in Cincinnati. And it was determined between the two or three of them talking that I would go to Cincinnati and I would live at, at the home of Dr. Harry Crum and his wife Hazel. I did do that for uh, two different school terms. But on the last school term, uh, what I did was I sent in the mech popular mechanics magazine, I think, is fill out this if you want to consider becoming an Army Air Corps pilot. So I sent it in as directed to Washington, D.C. And lo and behold, I got an answer back rather quickly. Now we're coming up to a Christmas vacation. And because uh, back in those days, the college terms ended after s Christmas, into January. And with that situation, uh, I got this notice to report to Wright Field at Dayton, Ohio, for a physical examination on such and such a day at such and such a time. Well, I got, I, on that day, I drove my car right to Cincinnati, I mean, right from Cincinnati to uh, Wright Patterson. I say Wright Patterson, now it's Wright Field, and when I started flying, it was Wright Field and uh, Patterson Field. They weren't related in the way they are today. But uh, this right field was a technical place, and they had a flight surgeon there who gave these flight physicals to the to people who had made an application. I reported in exactly all the time that I was supposed to be there, and I was welcomed, and all of that sort of thing, uh, by a, a, a sergeant. If I remember right, he was a tech sergeant. But he knew what he was doing. And uh, the doctor came in and said, hello, I'll, this sergeant was taking answers to questions from me. I uh, finished that sort of thing, and the sergeant says, come on, I'm going to give you a check. And we started doing two or three different things. I'd forgotten what it was, and the morning was going by. Now, I don't know, at that particular time, I think there's about five other men, boys, that started at the same time I did. And I noticed walking back and forth to this sergeant about the noon hour, after having done so many things, uh, I thought, well, you know, where are these people? I asked this sergeant, I said, where are they going? He said, well, they got dismissed because they couldn't pass the physical. But he said, don't you worry, you're doing fine, stay with it. I said, fine, I'm not worried, I'll pass it. And with that, why I did, I got passed uh, by the flight surgeon. He read all the stuff that the sergeant had done, and then he gave me my eye test, uh, vision, side vision, and all that, and uh, coordination, distance, depth perception. And two or three times, that back in those days, what they did, you had, a, you had a rope, or not a rope, but a strong cord, and he had two objects in front of you, about 40 feet away, looked like pencils standing on end. One was fixed, you couldn't move it, and the other one, they would take and move it with the flight surgeon and move it back and forth to the cord. Now, after you'd done that about two or three times, he said, are you, are you holding on to that cord? And I said, no, no. He thought maybe I was holding it because I put them right together every time he did it. So he looked, he said, one more time. He said, drop the cords, then pick them up. I said, oh, fine. I dropped the cord, picked them up, and felt them out, pulled them out puts two objects together. He said, okay, you're passed, you're, you're passed. 
and we went and sat at the desk and he said, when would you like to go to flower school? I said, well, as soon as I can. He said, I know there's going to be a class starting in February next year. Now, this is December. I said, oh, there will be a February class. And he said, would you like to go to that? I said, I'm ready to go. Well, believe it or not, I got word, I don't know how fast it was, but it's faster than mail today from, I got returned after the surgeon had sent the information in, I got another letter telling me to go to Fort Thomas, Kentucky to be sworn in as a flying cadet. I did that. Now this is still in the month of, of uh, December. I got sworn in to be there. They gave me, they made me a flying cadet. They gave me the, a travel voucher to go from Cincinnati to San Antonio, Texas, uh, etc. the normal procedures. <coughs> well, okay. I finished out my school in January. And with that, the next thing I had to do was to go down to, I didn't have to, but I did. I wanted to go down to Miami and talk to folks, just go tell the old man that I was leaving to school to go to learn to fly airplane. I, <coughs> in Miami, I did that. I went down by train, paying my own way and that sort of thing, down and back. And uh, I went down there. And after I'd been there, I don't know, a day or something like that, my mother and I were sitting in the kitchen. She was preparing lunch. And uh, she said, have you told your father yet? I, she said, what's, what's on your mind? I said, I'm going to leave college. I'm going to go to San Antonio, the Air Corps, uh, flying school, and learn to fly airplanes. And I, have you told your father yet? I said, no, not yet. She looked out the window and here he came walking down the driveway. He said, well, he's coming in right now. We're going to have lunch. She said, don't you think you should tell him? I said, fine. So we started the meal just like you'd always do it. And finally I got my nerve right up to peak. And I looked at him and I said, uh, I want to tell you I'm leaving college. I'm going to go down to flying school at San Antonio, Texas, be an air, learn to be a pilot in the Army Air Corps. He looked at me and said, you know, I've been supporting you. Uh, ever since you've been little and I've been sending you through school. But since you're leaving school, you're on your own from here on. And go kill yourself. I don't give a damn. With that, my mother said, Paul, if you want to fly airplanes, you go ahead. You'll be all right. Now, that was my introduction to getting to the flying school. You had a very close relationship with your mother and she was very supportive. Well, look at I was afraid of the old man because he was a disciplinarian. He was a tough guy. But he was as fair as anybody could possibly be. But still, you know, mamas are more loving and caring and all that sort of stuff than, than the father. Now, my father said this, go kill yourself, because he had fought in World War I. He was an infantry captain. And he was in World War I. And he, on one occasion, had to ride in a motorcycle sidecar uh, with a dispatch rider. And that scared the heck out of him. He just couldn't stand a motorcycle from that day. He also got a ride. He wanted to get a ride in an airplane, and that scared him. He said, I never was scared of anything the Germans were doing, but riding with a motorcycle dri uh, driver and riding in an airplane, it just scared him to death. And uh, with that, uh, he never let me get near talking about uh, a motorcycle, a motorized bicycle, or, uh, anything like that, or an airplane. Forget it. And uh, that's what, uh, that's what got me, as I say, attached to my mother very carefully because she had faith. She said, if you want to go and fly, you go ahead because you're going to be all right. Now, during World War II, if we skip ahead to World War II a little bit, you flew 25 missions in Europe. Well, that is an iffy, but I was exposed to enemy fire more than 25 times by flying <laughs> liaison missions, carrying... Uh, girls around for the UFO, USO, and flying uh, a couple of high-ranking officers around. One of the, the, the first flight, the high-ranking officer, was with Mark Clark. Uh, I was ordered to go to uh, North Africa with Mark Clark, but we would land at Gibraltar. He, Mark Clark, would be with the man from the State Department, and they were going to go from on a British submarine from Gibraltar to uh, the shores of North Africa, somewhere where this guy had a, had a hacienda sitting out there, and that was Admiral Darlan, and he was the man that was going to be approached uh, quite properly. And, uh, Mark Clark, well, I flew Mark Clark down to 
Gibraltar. Uh, in a eventful flight, uh, we had to watch out for the Germans at, at uh, with uh, off the land's end down there. But that was about the only thing we had to do uh, with that fight, with that flight. But I landed down there with orders to my orders, not everybody else's. I wanted to get if Admiral Darland was doing a double cross, they would get word to me by code through the British the system. They would get word to me that something was going wrong. I had two airplanes, mine and another one that was flown by a uh, man by the name of Weichel. And Jesse uh, was going to drop bombs. I was going to drop bombs to create confusion. Then I would fly down, get land, pick Clark and his Mr. Murphy up, and bring them back to Gibraltar. Nothing like that happened. Uh, it was a very smooth and easy deal. Uh, they uh, made their deal to get Admiral Darland not to enforce such a rigid defense uh, against the landing and that sort of thing. It worked fine. I had flown 17 or 18 missions before I got this thing. Then back to uh, Polbrook where I was flying. I flew some more. Uh, then I got orders uh, to go to la uh, down to Hearn and take five airplanes with me, my airplane and five more. We're going to fly General Eisenhower from Hearn to Gibraltar, where he would be until they effected the land, safe landing and call in uh, for uh, occupation of, of North Africa. Now, Mark, Mark Clark was with him at that in the same time. He was flying a different airplane, but I was flying uh, General Eisenhower. Now, why was I doing it? Number one, uh, I probably had a little more experience than any of the other guys that were flying airplanes at that time because, see, I, the war didn't start until uh, 1941, and I had graduated in, in February of 38 from the flying school, So, and I had flown every minute I could get an airplane. Uh, my duty station at that time was uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, where we had, you know, no real tight regulations. We operated on the same schedule that the infantry school operated on and all that because that's what we were, support troops for the infantry school. With General Eisenhower and his staff down at Hearn, we were waiting for the weather to clear. They got in and came in just about dark to get in the airplanes. Well, it wasn't very good weather. And with that, he decided I don't want to be down here with a bunch of strangers. It could be giveaway for something. We'll go back to London where we we'll, won't be missed and we'll come back again. It was about 10 days later when he, matter of fact, it was on the eve that they were going to invade uh, North Africa. And he came down, weather was still terrible. And I'm standing under the wing of my B-17 with the general and with Jimmy Doolittle, who was riding the second airplane behind me. Uh, I don't remember, there's a couple other guys who were there, but we had water dripping on us, and it was just terrible. And I guess the best word is, the British called them pea soup fogs, because they had all kinds of water vapor hanging in there, and you couldn't, you couldn't walk without getting water, getting wet, and that's why the airplane is getting wet, it's cooler and it was getting that stuff and dripping off. And, and uh, we're standing there waiting, and it's almost midnight at night because the weatherman from the base had come in. Each time weather was chill, you know, marginal for takeoff even. They just said it was dangerous. He, last time, we're standing under the airplane, and he comes up, and he looks at General Eisenhower, and he says, General, I cannot promise you any better weather than this for the next four days. He said, it's terrible, but that's what, that's my forecast. We'll have the same thing for four days. And Eisenhower looked at Jimmy Doolittle and he said, uh, Jimmy, what should we do? Doolittle looked right back at him and said, don't ask me, General. Paul's flying the airplane. He's the man. And uh, with that, I was looking at General Eisenhower. I said, General Eisenhower, I realized the importance of you and your staff and the people. But if I'd been here alone, I'd have been gone for this time. I wouldn't have been waiting all this time. I'd been gone. And he said, let's go. I got a war waiting on me. 
Oh, we boarded the airplanes and we had to be led out by a jeep. We couldn't see anything in front of us. They were, luckily, there was a white line on the s center of the runway. And I just took the white line and I lined it up and, and uh, advanced the throttles for takeoff. We went on down there. Now, before we got started uh, on that part of the journey, the general asked if me, he said, any way I can sit between you two guys? pilot the co-pilot and I said just a minute so I asked my crew chief I said anyway you got anything that general could sit on he said just a minute he went back to Bob and he came out with a two before and the two before went between the two seats Eisenhower got in there they put the two before in he sat down he never moved until we we're in Gibraltar but I found it to be extremely interesting now I've been told to stay away from the Brest Peninsula, fly wide, stay low, so that they can't pick up a radar because they have night fighters there. Uh, we're single engine, we're single fighter airplanes flying, you know, no formation, anything like that, in those conditions. And uh, we're going along. We avoided the Brest Peninsula, but the airplane behind me got intercepted by a night fighter. Now I was flying as low as I had nerve enough to fly. And that is, there was phosphorus on top of the water. And I, I knew where the, where the caps were, and I stayed right there on top of them. And I held it that way. I, I was sitting there just as interested it could be to ask a question once in a while. But I was on these solid instruments at that time, and just to, except for the, the uh, white caps. And uh, we cleared, but the navigator told me it was clear of the best peninsula, and I, started, I climbed up to, I don't know, some altitude, like five or 6,000 feet. The weather was happy, was all right up there, no problem. We went on in Gibraltar and landed. Eisenhower got out right away and was taken by the people there to a place that was a headquarters where they had communications there, where they had contact with what's going on. Uh, the air, the uh, uh, parachuters had already jumped, and uh, we were there waiting. Uh, just what's the next move? Well, the next move, oh, I, with the airplane, when I got out of it and General had departed, I looked around. Number one, I had a lot of salt spray on my windshield. Number two, the ball turret was covered with salt. So I had stayed pretty close to the white caps and that, uh, I always talked about that. And Eisenhower later complimented me and, you know, so that sort of thing about what a nice ride he had. And I didn't know until just a year ago, Eisenhower held a private pilot's license. He had earned it as a first lieutenant in the Philippines. Now that's that was really a new one to me, but the man that told me that was uh, the uh, a bi his biographer, and Stephen Ambrose. Uh, he asked me something about the same thing, and I told him about this. He said, "Well, General Eisenhower, he said he sure enjoyed that ride because he said that you were the best uh, pilot in the Army Air Corps." I said, well, I don't know about that, but I said, I, I got the man down there all right. I didn't want to hurt him or me either, and I knew damn well I could do it. Uh, that was my attitude to him. He said, said, well, you did fine. Hap Arnold also said that you were the best pilot that they had. So Eisenhower and Hap Arnold both said that. Was it true? Well, like I said, I mean, my God, look at all the pilots that were, so how could I? I oh, he was giving me his congratulations uh, and that sort of thing. Or he was congratulatory with Ambrose talking about me. And of course, I was happy as hell that I pleased him. But later on, when they had the Bikini Bob test and he was uh, campaigning, he flew out the Pacific. They, they landed at uh, uh, Kwajalein, where we were operating airplanes for Kwajalein. I'd gone been sent out on a flight that particular day when he landed, but they did land and he got a hold of the executive officer there and he said, tell Paul Tibbetts that I came by to say hello to him. And, uh, I, well anyway, I, he had to do that because he didn't have to stop at Quadsland, but he did. And uh, with that, uh, uh, I don't know I, what else to go, oh, trying to get back to m number of missions. Well, I flew three ladies, one of them a young girl, whose name was Mitzi Mayfair at that those, those days, but I can't think of the other two's name. I started this other stuff, but when I got through with Get Gibraltar and uh, Mark Clark all settled, 
of Mark Clark first and then taking them all back down there. I flew missions between those two, and I got three or four more bombing the soap pens in Lorient and that sort of thing, watching the 1,100 pound bombs hit the concrete and bounce back up in the air and explode, uh, that sort of thing. Why did Leslie Groves select you? Groves? Yes. Yeah. Now, Groves had nothing to do with me as far as the selection. I was working at that time. I had been back in the States on working on the, uh, the B-29 airplanes. I was called back out of North Africa uh, from General Doolittle's headquarters. I'd flown new missions in North Africa from down in the desert, but I was at, he pulled me up there on Christmas Day of 19. He pulled me to his, flew me back to his headquarters when he went back. He'd come down to have Christmas lunch with uh, his bombing outfit there, the 97th Bomb Group. And when he got there, he told me to pack my bag. He's going to go back to all Gibraltar. I said, sir, I'd rather stay here and, fl and fly my emissions and so forth. He said, nobody asked you what you wanted to do. You're going to go back with me. I, n I don't have anybody in my headquarters that has the experience with B-17 airplanes that you got. So I want you there. Yes, sir. And I did. I went back with him. And uh, I got started. Uh, I don't know how long it was, I can't remember, but on the next thing was, he called me into his office one morning, he said, uh, how long would it take to pack your bag? I looked at him, I said, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? He said, do it in 15, come back out here, I'm going to fly you down to, to uh, I'll take you to the airport, I'm going to fly, have them fly you down, here. there's an airplane going down to Liberia. He said, you're going down there to catch a Panama Clipper, a Pan Am Clipper back at, starting back to the States. You're supposed to go to Washington, D.C. per orders, et cetera. I said, oh, yes, sir. Well, I moved right along as fast as I could. I got him back. His staff car took me to the airport. He wished me good luck at, at his office waiting for this, me to get to the staff car. And uh, uh, he's, well, anyway, I got, I got in the staff car, went, did that. I went down and came back into uh, Miami, Florida after riding for seven days in the Goonie Bird, except for that one night flight over, over water in a Pan Am Clipper. And so I got there while my folks were living there, of course, and uh, I had a, a period in there, travel uh, delay granted for, I think it was about 10 days time, but then report. Well, I got there and I had spent a few days with my mother and my father, and I got a phone call uh, from Washington that uh, the man that I was supposed to see, two-star general, his aide office called and said, look it, uh, we're going to have you come here, but uh, we don't need you right now because you're going to go to Wichita, Kansas to fl fly B-29s and see what's the problem that the factory's having with them. Now, I had heard in this business, I heard by not just this one man, he said the factory had been having trouble. But when I got down to the nitty gritty, Boeing had said that the airplane was no damn good, they weren't going to build it. And they said that when Eddie Allen got killed, because they lost all of their experience. He had his whole crew with him. He was not only, he was the project officer, but he was a test pilot and uh, so forth. People with him were extremely skilled in the B-29 airplane, but they all died as a result of a crash in the meatpacking plant out there as they approached Lindbergh Field about a mile away.